hope you've spent your weekend shining your shoes because the Vols are going bowling and we cannot be more excited about it. Uh, this is another week of the Triple Play. I'm Danielle and I'm joined today by Colby Deering. We have so much we're going to be talking about, especially with the Vols. Uh, Thanksgiving brought about a lot to be thankful for in terms of UT football. So let's just go ahead and get started with it. The Vols beat Bandy 24-17 to this weekend. It puts the Vols at... Uh, 74 and 29 with five ties and 108 meetings with the Commodores. Uh, the game was a little slower than I think most people expected, especially from the offensive standpoint. I think we expected a lot more from Josh Dobbs. Uh, he was he went 11 for 20, 92 yards, two interceptions passing, but he did score two touchdowns rushing with 21 carries and 91 yards. But um, like I said, the offense started really slow. The balls got on the board first. Um, at the 818 mark of the first quarter um, with Cam Sutton uh, getting a 76-yard punt return, which I think kind of set the tone of the game in terms of defense, but a really kind of, like I said, slow performance from the offense. Yeah, you know, I think um, since he's got a lot of their playmakers out uh, right now, and when uh, Jalen Hurd went out with an injury, you know, Tennessee's lack of depth in the running game really hurt him, and they were really limited to just Lang and Dobbs, um, and, you know, that's also hard for Dobbs to pass. And Dobbs, you know, he didn't have his best game by any means, but, uh, you know, only three Tennessee, only two receivers for Tennessee had a catch, and Marlon Lane also was involved. So uh, Tennessee was just really lacking a lot of guys that usually have on offense this game. And, you know, they were still able to pull out the win, but uh, definitely not their brightest moment this season. Definitely, and you mentioned uh, Jalen Hurd. He went out. <clears throat> early in the game with an upper body injury. Um, but it just, I couldn't help but wonder how different things could have been for the Vols. I mean, while he was in, he had 21 uh, rushing yards before going out, and the Vols overall had 170 rushing, which is kind of um, low for what we've been used to as of late. But um, I, I just feel like the numbers could have been higher for the Vols there. But um, looking over at the Vandy offense, they had 100 and 49 passing yards total. Uh, Patton Robinette was 11 for 22, 130, 131 yards, one touchdown, two interceptions. And uh, Johnny McCray, Johnny McCrary, whenever he was in the game, was two for seven, 18 yards, uh, no touchdowns, but one interception. I really didn't expect Vanderbilt to come out looking like they did. They looked a little better than I think most people were expecting. A uh, really good game from them. But uh, this win, not only was it able to put the Vols in contention for a bowl game. Um, it was the first, it made it the first two game road win streak since 2006. Um, before this, the Vols beat South Carolina in Columbia, which was really big. But um, in 2006, those two wins came against Georgia and South Carolina. So it's kind of funny to see South Carolina still mentioned there. But like we said, the Vols are going to a bowl game first time since 2010. So this is a really big thing for the Vols. Um, Right now at the season, the Vols are 6-6, six 3-5 and six, three and five in the SEC. But some of the predictions for um, the bowl that the Vols will be in is it's looking like it's a Liberty Bowl. And most people are thinking it's going to be against Texas. Um, I've heard other people over the weekend mentioning that if it's not the Liberty Bowl, they could be matched up with Notre Dame somewhere. But I think either one would be a really good matchup for the Vols. Yeah, I saw a lot of uh, weird matchups. I saw the Liberty Bowl. They had Texas and they also had Northwest Virginia. Mm -hmm. And then the Notre Dame matchup was in the Bell Bowl, which That's is in right. Charlotte. Mm -hmm. And I also saw uh, us playing Duke in the Bell Bowl as well. So all the matchups they're uh, proclaiming that might happen right now are all really interesting matchups. All those are good teams, or they've got some kind of relation to Tennessee with David Cutcliffe and Duke. So mm -hmm. I think uh, any game that the Vols are in is probably going to be an exciting one. And I think Tennessee will travel well to all of them. So. Should be interesting to see. Definitely, and I didn't even think about that Duke matchup. That would yeah. be really exciting to see, like you mentioned, with cut clip yeah. and everything. But um, like you also mentioned, any of the matchups would be good for the Vols. I have a feeling no matter where they go, um, the fans are definitely going to travel uh, to it. But if it is, um, if it if the Vols do end up going to the Liberty Bowl, like I said, it'll be in Memphis. I feel like that'll be a better turnout for the Vols. But um, if that is the case, then I believe the game will take place on December 29th, and it should be a 1 o'clock kickoff, I believe. So um, we'll look forward to that. We should find out soon what the bowl situation will look like for the Vols. But either way, it's a really exciting time for Tennessee football, and I know the fans cannot be more excited about it. 
looking over it on um, more SEC football, uh, it was, of course, rivalry week. It's always exciting for college football, but the four SEC ACC matchups that happened this weekend, the ACC won all four of them. Clemson beat South Carolina 35 to 17. Louisville beat Kentucky 44 to 40. A really close one there that was really exciting. Uh, Georgia Tech beat Georgia in overtime 30 to 24, and uh, Florida State still finding ways to just get away with a win. And I'm not sure how this is happening, but um, they beat Florida 24 to 19. But I think what everybody's talking about in that game was Jameis Winston throwing four interceptions. I mean, he's been kind of inconsistent as of late, but I don't really know if those four interceptions were what people were really looking for. Yeah, you know, uh, it's really kind of been Florida State goes as Jameis goes, and um, most of the time this year we've seen Jameis, you know, been he's been average in the first half, and in the second half he'd really pick it up and play uh, much better. And this game, you know, he never really hit his stride in the second half. Mm-hmm. And uh, Florida State barely hung on. And, but you got to really give Florida credit. You know, Trayon Harris had probably his best game passing-wise. He threw over 150 yards. And, you know, and their run game was good as always. So I think in the end that Florida State just had more talent and they found a way to win again. Definitely. And I think this puts them up to, like, 28 um, straight wins, which is really impressive for them. Um, I mean – I, their last few games, they've barely gotten by with a win, and it's just, I know for a lot of people, it's very frustrating because, um, especially, well, I mean, most Florida State fans are saying, yeah, wins are wins, we're going to take them. That's why we have 28 um, straight wins, but it's just, it makes you wonder if they should still be as high as they are in rankings. I mean, like I said, they are, they are undefeated this season, but um, just squeaking by, by against certain teams, it just makes you wonder. Mm-hmm. Looking at some other games in the SEC, the Egg Bowl uh, proved to be really exciting if you're an Ole Miss fan. Um, big upset there. Ole Miss beat Mississippi State 31-17. to uh, Jalen Walton and Jordan Wilkins, I don't really think anybody expected them to come out and be as big of a duo as they were for this game. They both had great performances. Uh, Wilkins had two carries for 42 yards, no touchdowns, but he did have a passing touchdown. He threw um, a 31-yard touchdown pass to Cody Core, which ended up being the winning touchdown. The play itself was beautiful. Um, he got the pitch from Wallace uh, and then just threw it out there. I don't really, I wasn't expecting that. It was only his second pass of the season, I, or second pass of his career, I believe. So um, that was really exciting. And Walton had 14 carries for 148 yards and one touchdown. And that one touchdown was a 91-yard uh, run. Really exciting game there. Um, I really thought Mississippi State would come in with um, a little bit more passion. I mean, they played hard, but they definitely could have put up bigger numbers. Yeah, I was surprised too, but uh, Mississippi State's performance, you know, you're, they were playing for a, a spot in the playoff, mm-hmm. and uh, at that point they still had a chance to make it to the SEC championship because they didn't know how the Bama game was going to go. Right. But, um, yeah, I mean, Mississippi State's offense didn't play that bad. You know, Prescott had a good game passing, and they ran the ball all right, but they just had no answer for Ole Miss. They had a balanced attack. Uh, Bo Wallace threw for almost 300 yards, and the team as a whole ran for over 200 yards. And, you know, they made uh, they made some plays on defense as well. And, yeah, they, they brought out the – they threw the kitchen sink at them. You know, they really – they threw the trick plays in there. And I was surprised by Mississippi State's performance and, you know, uh, I think Dan Mullen was too. You heard in his press game conference mm-hmm. that uh, he wasn't very happy at all. And yeah, you know Mississippi State went from having a great year to now. Is this year even really a good year? You mm-hmm. lose all these seniors and you're not getting that much out of it. So it'll be interesting to see how they uh, rebound from this in the bowl game. Absolutely, it'll be really exciting. I mean, Mississippi State was really exciting to watch at the beginning of the season, but now it's just they're just falling apart, and it's kind of tough to watch. But um, should be exciting to see. Uh, where they land um, with bowl games and such. But looking over at the Mizzou-Arkansas game, Missouri beat Arkansas 21-14, to which gives Missouri the SEC East title, um, putting them into the uh, SEC championship next weekend. But Arkansas, they looked so promising at the very beginning of the game. Uh, going into the fourth quarter, they were still holding up a lead of 14-6, to but Missouri just came out and scored 15 unanswered points in the fourth quarter. I mean, with... 
the past few weeks <clears throat> that um, Arkansas was having, I know a lot of people were still wondering why Arkansas was doing so well against this Missouri team at the beginning. But, I mean, they were coming off of winning – Two, they shut out two SEC teams uh, beforehand, which was, I know whenever they beat LSU 17 to nothing a couple weeks back, that snapped a 17-game uh, losing streak in the SEC. So, I mean, you can't really be surprised with this Arkansas team. They're 6-6, six and 2-6 six, and six in the SEC, but those two wins were very dominant wins. Yeah, and you know, I think Arkansas got a bad rep this year. They They were a good team. They just... They played in the SEC West, and that was no easy feat for them. Mm -hmm. You know, they have a good running game. But, you know, as far as the game went, you know, once again, Missouri, they went ugly, mm -hmm. and they found a way to win ugly again. Matty Mock had a good game, and, you know, the rushing game wasn't what it usually was, mm -hmm. but the Missouri's just found ways to win all year. And, you know, I think they'll give Bama a game in the championship game. I don't know if they'll win, but, mm -hmm. you know, they definitely earned their right to play in the SEC championship. Definitely, and like you mentioned, their rushing game was really slow this time around. I mean, they still had 158 total rushing yards, but that's really low for what we've seen from them. Russell Hansbro had 20 carries for 91 yards. No touchdown there for him, but Marcus Murphy, 11 carries, 58 yards, and one touchdown. Um, I really, I mean, yeah, Hansbro put up 91 yards, but I was still just expecting a lot from him. He's um, really been... Um, talked highly of all seasons. I mean, past couple of games, he's been kind of quiet, but those 91 yards are not bad for him. And Matty Mock um, passing 25 uh, completions out of 42 attempts, 265 yards with one touchdown and one interception. Um, those are really good numbers for him. Total, um, totally for Missouri, they still put up 423 uh, total yards on offense, so not bad there. But... Um, Definitely, it should be really exciting to see Missouri in the SEC um, title game, and they will be taking on Bama, like you said. Uh, Alabama beat Auburn in the Iron Bowl this weekend, 55-44. to And th this was one of the most exciting ones I've seen. I mean, coming off of last year with the way it ended um, with Auburn just shocking everybody, uh, it was just back and forth this, enti this entire game. Blake Sims was 20 for 27, 312 yards, four touchdowns and three interceptions. Uh, for Alabama, and Nick Marshall for Auburn, 27 for 43, 456 yards, three touchdowns and one interception there, but I feel like what most people are talking about is Amari Cooper had a fantastic performance, 13 receptions, 224 yards with three touchdowns. <clears throat> um, personally, I feel like this was one of the strongest performances from uh, Alabama all season. I mean, against this Auburn team who's been known for their speed, um, all season, uh, just overall a really exciting game. But looking at um, Auburn's rushing numbers, they only had 172 rushing yards, which I thought to be kind of surprising. Yeah, uh, obviously their system is a run-heavy system, but um, they had a lot of success um, through the air. You know, mm -hmm. Nick Marshall threw for 456 yards, which is probably a career high mm -hmm. if I had to guess for him. And I really thought, watching the first half, I really thought Auburn was going to uh, pull it up the game because they were just throwing bombs over the top of the Alabama secondary. But in the second half, uh, Armani Cooper, he just took over the game. And he probably had the best performance, I would say, in the SEC this year. And, you know, it's probably right up there with uh, Melvin Gordon's game and mm -hmm. the Oklahoma running back game that broke Melvin Gordon's record the next week. But... Um, I think Cooper's like a strong, he's a strong a strong shot for the Heisman now. And uh, he carried them to the victory for sure in that game. And yeah, it was a really, you don't usually see Alabama score 55 points mm -hmm. and only win by 11. Uh, so, you know, definitely not what I was expecting, but uh, all in all, it was, a, it was a fun game to watch. Definitely. And um, I mean, this was a really high scoring game, but the 99 points that were scored on Saturday was the most in the history of the Iron Bowl, um, which was first played in 1892. So, I mean, for these two teams that always come out and have a really good performance during this game, it was just really shocking that this was the highest. I feel like that could have happened like long ago, but um, really interesting to see. Uh, like we've talked, like we've already said, the SEC championship will feature Missouri and Alabama, and it will take place this Saturday at four o'clock on CBS from Atlanta. So it'll be really exciting to see what happens. Um, Bama is ranked number one right now. Missouri is number seventeen. 
So it should be a good matchup. Don't know if Missouri's going to come out with the win because Bama just looks really strong this season. Um, it's always tough to beat them in these types of games, but it should be really exciting. And like I said, Bama is number one right now in the nation. Behind them, you have Florida State, Oregon, and TCU. The college football playoff standings don't come out until Tuesday night, but the AP standings came out last night, or I should say um, on Sunday. But um, looking at these top four, it just makes me wonder if this is the exact same top four we're going to see on Tuesday night for the college football playoff system. Uh, Baylor is at number five right now, and um, Ohio State's at number six, but I just, some part of me says that we'll see Baylor in that top four rather than TCU on Tuesday night. Yeah, um, if you look at Baylor and TCU's resumes, I think Baylor has the better resume, and of mm -hmm. course they beat TCU. Right. Um, they've had a couple of games that probably were a little closer than they should have been. Mm -hmm. I also think that um, Ohio State's a team to watch out for. I was kind of wondering if they weren't going to, if they weren't going to jump TCU. Mm -hmm. But now that um, JT Barrett's gone out, I think that the committee's going to want to watch their um, the championship game and see. Uh, how they play without him because, you know, he's obviously been a key part of their team this year. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that you're looking at probably unless uh, some unforeseen upset happens, which with Florida State and Georgia Tech very well could, mm -hmm. um, I think you're looking at the race for the last spot between TCU, Baylor, and Ohio State. And mm -hmm. I think I would probably give the edge to Baylor as well. Definitely, and I would give them the edge right now, too, looking at the resumes, but there's just that part of me all season has been saying TCU. I've been saying that they could be a dark horse if it came down to them and um, if it came down to having them in the playoff. Um, but, I mean, either way, you're going to have an exciting playoff system. Uh, Bama would be taking on either TCU or Baylor if they kept that number one spot, which I'm predicting they will. Uh, Florida State and Oregon, like, I've said if they have the second and third spot there, that could be a really exciting game. But I just I would give Oregon the edge in that matchup, just because I think Florida State has just gotten away with uh, wins a little too easily. They've just come back and just like barely taken it. But no matter what, it should be really exciting. Um, getting I mean, now that we're getting down to the edge of it, it's just it's really exciting to think about with bowl season coming up, um, all the conference championships. It'll be really exciting. But looking over at the Heisman. Right now, the top five um, are Marcus Mariota from Oregon, Melvin Gordon from Wisconsin, Trevon Boykin from TCU, and then we have a tie for fourth between J JT Barrett um, from Ohio State, like you already mentioned, um, with his injury, and then Dak Prescott uh, from Mississippi State. And Amari Cooper is not in that top five, which is just really crazy to think about. He was third last week on ESPN's Heisman Watch. But whenever I was thinking about his performance this week and why he's not in that top five, it kind of blows my mind. But then I realized when this was updated, the list was updated at 9.49 on Saturday night on ESPN's website. So it was before the end of the game. It just kind of makes me wonder with the performance that he had, would he be in that top five? Yeah, and... Um... In my opinion, I think, you know, I don't think Prescott's probably going to be invited to New York. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, they get two losses in a row, and he had a pretty bad performance against Alabama in a mm -hmm. game that he had a chance to really help himself. I think he probably uh, eliminated himself. Um, obviously, I don't see JT Barrett uh, mm -hmm. ending up there either. And, you know, Trayvon Boykin uh, has played good this year, but he just hasn't really – he doesn't have that Heisman moment, for one, and mm -hmm. he's not uh, got the talk of the others. Um, for one, I think if Todd Gurley never gets suspended, he would have ran away with it. Mm -hmm. But I think that the three that are probably going to end up there will be Mariota, um, Gordon, and Cooper. Mm -hmm. And, you know, personally, I would probably vote for Gordon, but mm -hmm. I think that uh, his team uh, didn't show up as many right. would have liked. So I think it'll probably end up going to Mariota, but I think that uh, Cooper's got a strong chance, especially depending on how he plays in the SEC championship game. Definitely. I do like the top three that you have there. I would agree with that. Um, just, I don't, I could see Melvin Gordon winning it. Um, he has been strong this season, but I mean, everybody's been talking Mariota all season. I mean, Mariota has been in the contention since last season. So, I mean, no matter who's in there, I think your top three that you've put down. Yeah, I do see that happening. Um, but I mean, we still have championships to go, so anything can change, but um, it should be really exciting. And looking at some other 
uh, looking at all the scores this weekend for Rivalry Week, um, TCU beat Texas on uh, Thanksgiving night, 48 to 10. That was a really dominant performance from TCU, um, putting them at 10 and one on the season, seven and one in the Big 12. Uh, looking at some other exciting matchups, Marshall had their first loss of the season, which was kind of hard for me to see because I'd been going off of that little Cinderella story all season, but they lost to Western Kentucky 67 to 66 in overtime. Um, Marshall's had a really good season. They've been ranked for, I feel like, a majority of the season. Um, they're 24th right now, but um, really exciting season for them. It was tough to see them lose that game to Western Kentucky. UCLA uh, lost to Stanford 31 to 10 there. Um, that's a really big upset for Stanford. Um, that was a pretty exciting game to watch. Uh, I didn't get to watch all of it. I watched most of it, but I mean, Stanford just looked really good. Uh, Arizona beat Arizona State 42 to 35. Oregon beat Oregon State in demanding fashion 47 to 19. Baylor beat Texas Tech 48 to 46. Close game there. I was not expecting Texas Tech to come out like they did. Um, only losing by two points to a seventh-ranked Baylor. That was really exciting. Ohio State and Michigan, always an exciting matchup there. Uh, Ohio State won 42-28. to I really thought Michigan could come out with um, a pretty good performance. Um, I mean, they got a touchdown in every quarter. That's something to look at for them. But Ohio State, just they've looked really good all season. Uh, Michigan State beat Penn State 34-10. to I know Michigan State started off the game with, um, I want to say, like, it was over 90 yards, uh, might have been like a 97-yard uh, opening kickoff return for a touchdown, which was really exciting uh, for Michigan State. I have some family members who are Penn State fans and Penn State grads, so it was kind of funny to see their reactions on the game, but um, good win there for Michigan State. Looking at some other games, Wisconsin beat Minnesota 34-24, to Kansas State beat Kansas 51-13, to uh, Utah beat Colorado 38 to 34. Really close game there. Uh, Colorado's two and ten on this season, and Utah is now eight and four on this season. But going into that, I really expected Utah to just dominate Colorado. But four game or four point uh, game there, not too bad. And Boise State uh, beat Utah State 50 to 19. That's a score that most people are used to seeing with Boise State. Um, but really dominating win there for the Broncos. But overall. Uh, rivalry week did not disappoint for college football fans. It was really exciting no matter what uh, conference you're in. Uh, really good matchups, some big upsets, but uh, it'll be really exciting as we go into bowl season like we've talked about to see what all happens. Going over to the NFL, the Titans still just cannot click. They're now 2-10 and on the season. They lost to the Texans uh, yesterday 45-21. to Zach Mettenberger, 13 for 19. 184 yards, one touchdown, one interception. I don't get what it is with this Titans team. Yeah, um, me neither. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's hard to watch. Uh, I've actually just stopped watching, to be honest. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Mittenberg has played well. He got hurt, obviously. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it was in the third quarter. And Jake Walker came in, and his first pass was an interception. And I know my dad sent me a text. He's like, you just can't make this stuff up. <laughs> but, I mean, I don't know what the Titans are going to do. I think that, you know, this year's obviously gone for them. And, mm -hmm. you know, as a Titans fan, I'm just thinking draft pick the rest of the way. I hope they lose mm -hmm. out, which is crazy. But, um, you know, I don't – Mittenberger's played good. I don't know if, if that first pick they want to take a quarterback or not. Obviously, Todd Gurley and Melvin Gordon are there, and the rushing game's been terrible uh, mm -hmm. for the team. You know, they didn't even get to 100 yards. They don't most games. Right. Um, for whatever quarterback gets to come in, you know, if they do draft one, they've got a good receiving core with a lot of promising players. Of course, Justin Hunter went down. Mm -hmm. He's ruptured his spleen, I believe. So, mm -hmm. And the defense needs work, too. It's just, it's just a lot of holes on the Titans team right now, and uh, it's probably going to be a while before the Titans get back to what they used to be. Definitely, and like you said, for them to lose out for the rest of the season, I've seen some people talking about it uh, yesterday saying that that would be the Titans thing to do, um, just to lose out to get that pick. But, I mean, like you said, if they do want to get um, any type of improvement, it's really going to fall back on who they do pick up in the draft. But, I mean, I'm not 
I'm not a huge Titans fan um, by any means, but for them to be 2-10 at this point in the season is kind of tough um, whenever you're around Titans fans all the time to see them kind of just disappointed in their team. But maybe the Titans can find some kind of turnaround for the rest of the season. I don't know, but it should be... Um, it should be interesting to see what happens with them. Uh, the Broncos beat the Chiefs 29 to 16 yesterday. Peyton went 17 for 34 with 179 yards and two touchdowns. But I think a, more of the focus for this game was not on the game itself. It was all focused more on Eric Berry, um, the former Vol, who uh, there was news broken last week that um, he could have. Uh, lymphoma, which is a form of cancer. There was a mass found in his chest. Um, I know it was really unsettling to hear that news, not only as a Vol fan, but as a human being. I mean, you don't like to hear that for any person, especially whenever it comes to an athlete that um, that you just know a lot about. But um, he was placed on a season-ending non-football illness list. But like I said, he is, he is pretty much the epitome of a Vol for life. I mean, he is one athlete that I think all ball fans can say that they absolutely love and admire. But, um, I mean, we wish him the best. We're supporting him throughout um, anything that goes on. But um, it was really nice to see his team with the shirts on that said something like, be bold. Uh, I want to say it was like, be bold, be strong, or something like that. I can't remember. But um, it's just, it's really nice to see this much support around a player. But, I mean, especially with Eric Berry, because he is a class act. Yeah, and, you know, it was just kind of surreal when you hear the news because you just don't think somebody, an NFL player for one, you know, mm -hmm. in uh, fantastic physical shape, Yeah. you know, it just kind of it's uh, it shows you that cancer can touch anybody. But, yeah, uh, definitely rough. And for somebody like Eric Berry, you know, uh, class act, like you said, mm -hmm. you know, never been in trouble off the field, does everything right. Uh, just tough, you know, as far as the game went, uh, Kansas City was kind of outmatched as far as uh, they went on both sides of the ball. And I think a uh, telling thing is that, you know, C.J. Anderson, he's been playing good uh, the past mm -hmm. couple of weeks, and he finally got to show it, you know, during prime time on the late night game. And, uh, well, I'm sorry, yeah, it was the late night mm -hmm. game, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. And, uh, and he really, uh, he had a great game, 168 yards. And I think it's shown that, you know, Denver's got uh, a double-edged sword to their offense now. And they're, uh, they're looking better and better as the season goes on to maybe make a run in the playoffs. Absolutely. And I know um, as of late, the Broncos could definitely use that big run. I mean, they did make it to the Super Bowl last season, but just, just not making things click. So um, it should be really interesting to see how the Broncos do with the rest of the season and where they do go in the postseason. Um, but looking around at some other games, Thanksgiving Day brought about some really exciting NFL football. The Lions beat the Bears 34-17. Uh, to 17. The Eagles, just kind of stunned, I guess you could say. Um, the Cowboys, 33-10. to 10. Mark Sanchez put up some pretty impressive numbers. He was 20 for 29, 217 yards with one touchdown. I don't really think many people expected that kind of performance, considering some of the history he's had with um, Thanksgiving games. But uh, really exciting win there for Philadelphia. And the Seahawks beat the 49ers 19-3. Russell Wilson was 15 for 22, 236 yards and one touchdown there. Um, that's kind of the performance we're used to seeing from him. But um, that put the Seahawks up to 8-4 and four on the season. Uh, 49ers are 7-5. and five. But looking at games from yesterday, uh, the Colts beat the Redskins 49-27. I know a lot of people were talking about Colt McCoy finally getting um, a chance to really show his stuff. And he pretty much showed out for this game. 31 for 47, 392 yards with three touchdowns. It's really refreshing to see him come back into the league um, and show that he is still a force um, in the NFL, I mean, he was really good in college, came to the pros, didn't really get that much hype, I guess you could say, with him. But um, he's kind of been a quiet uh, player while he was on the bench in different places. But it's nice to see him come out and score three touchdowns like he did. Looking over um, at the Bills and Browns, the Bills beat the Browns 26-10. to Chargers beat the Ravens in a really close matchup, 34-33. to um, There was a huge rally by the Chargers for the end of the game. Um, really late, but uh, really exciting there for San Diego. The Bengals beat the Buccaneers in also another close match, 14-13. to 
Um, I think that's the Bengals' third straight win. So um, that just makes the AFC North a little bit more exciting. The Jaguars beat the Giants 25 to 24. The Rams shut out the Raiders 52 to zero, which I mean, people were thinking maybe the Raiders can make a turnaround after winning last week, but no, now they're one and 11 on the season, 0 and six away. The Saints shocked the Steelers uh, by beating them in Pittsburgh 35 to 32. Um, Drew Brees threw five touchdowns. It was just an incredible performance from him. Uh, ben Roethlisberger still threw for 435 yards and two touchdowns. Um, the defense for the Steelers just looked a little slow, especially against Mark Ingram. He had 122 yards and no touchdown, no touchdowns um, rushed for, but I mean, he was finding holes to run through and it was just kind of a struggle for the Steelers yesterday. Uh, the Vikings beat the Panthers 31 to 13. Falcons beat the Cardinals 29 to 18. Uh, the Packers-Patriots game. So much hype going into this week, um, especially around it being a Tom Brady versus Aaron Rodgers matchup. But Aaron Rodgers and the Packers looked a little more dominant. 26-21 to 21 win there for the Packers. And Aaron Rodgers, 24 for 38, 368 yards and two touchdowns thrown by him. It was just an overall pretty exciting weekend in football, I guess you could say. Yeah, uh, Rodgers is playing. He's playing great football right now. It's it's fun to watch him because he just all of his passes just are so pretty and they're mm-hmm. usually right where they need to be. And he's got good players around him. You know, Eddie Lacy's really starting to break out into the NFL uh, spotlight. Mm-hmm. And I I really like the Packers right now. They definitely be my team to uh, to win. You know, the Patriots have been playing really well. Mm-hmm. So, but you know, Green Bay. They're looking like they're going to get the home field advantage, and uh, I'm pretty sure the Packers have only been beaten once or twice maybe mm-hmm. at Lambeau. So, yeah. So uh, that's definitely huge for them. And, yeah, I just really like how the Packers are playing right now. Absolutely. The Packers have been really exciting this season. Um, I, I do agree with the home field advantage. I think they could go far in the playoffs. It's kind of – it's really tough to just stop them this season um, at home. So it should be really exciting. Looking over at ball hoops real quick, uh, the men spent Thanksgiving uh, at the, playing at the Orlando Classic. They beat Santa Clara in their first game, 64-57. to Very sloppy game, but still a win for the Vols. But then they dropped uh, the next next two games. They lost to Kansas, 82-67, to and then they lost to Marquette in the third place game, 67-59. to um, I mean, it... All three games were a bit of the, were a bit of a struggle for the Vols, but they are showing a lot of heart, especially um, under a new coach. I honestly, in comparison to last season and this early in the season as well, I think that this team is throwing a lot harder um, for Donnie Tindall in comparison to how last season started for the Vols. Yeah, um, I like how they played so far this year. I don't know if they're going to be a tournament team. Mm-hmm. Um, you know they just they're really young right now. Yeah. They're actually dead last in fouls committed mm-hmm. in uh, the NCAA right now. They a fouling machine, but they play hard. Uh, and you have to understand that Sindel or I'm sorry Tindall system. Mm-hmm. It's a it's a complicated system. I actually like ran that defense in high school, and it's very hard to learn, and it takes some time to get okay. used to. But you know I like Coach Tindall. I think. Uh, you know, if he can get over this investigation mm-hmm. going forward, I think that the Vols have a, they have a shot to make the tournament this year. I'm not going to say that they're completely out, but mm-hmm. you know, they're they're probably going to need to. It'd be nice for them to win out the rest of their non-conference schedule, and then they're going to have to do really well in SEC play, and uh, that's tough, especially for this team. It's just really young, but they got a shot. They got a shot, and um, I'm, I've been impressed with how they played so far. Uh, and I'm excited for the future. I think Tindall's going to do a great job. Definitely. I'm really excited with um, this team's future. I mean, like I said, it's been kind of a struggle so far. They're 2-3 and three on the season, but, I mean, they are showing a lot of heart, and, I mean, there's a lot of potential with this team as well. But their next game will be Saturday at home versus Kansas State at 315. So that should be a really exciting game. And I believe it's on ESPN too. So if you can't come out, be sure to tune in. Should be a really exciting um, SEC Big 12 matchup. And looking over at the women, they have suffered their first two losses of the season um, just in a week. Uh, They lost to Chattanooga last Wednesday, 67 to 63. Complete shock right there. Um, and then they lost to Texas yesterday, 72-59. to 59. But, um, I mean, it's kind of tough to see 
the women have back-to-back -back losses like they did, especially a four-point loss to Chattanooga. Yeah, you know, the they took a hit early. Mm -hmm. um, Isabel Harrison went out, and, you know, yeah. she's arguably their best player. And uh, it's just been tough. You know, UTC is not an easy place to play by any means. No. Uh, and Texas is a quality team, and I think mm -hmm. that the girls team, uh, they're going to get better as time goes on. And they're always in it at the end of the season. I don't mm -hmm. think that – I think a lot of people are freaking out. I've heard a lot of people, you know, having their doubts about Coach Warwick. But, uh, yeah. Uh, I think everything's going to be fine. I think people just need to let this team grow uh, as a unit, and we'll see the results come uh, February and March. Absolutely. I agree there with you. Um, it is still really in early in the season for the women. I mean, they're 4-2 and two right now. That's not bad at all by any means. Um, they do still have a lot of potential. Like I said, it's really early in the season. You can't base the whole season off of these two losses. Um, like you said, it's not easy to play at UTC, and I want to say Texas was ranked sixth while the Lady Vols were fourth. So I mean, um, yeah, they were. These are kind of tough losses to deal with, but I mean, they were against quality teams and quality uh, atmospheres. So I mean, there's still a lot to look forward to with this team. Their next game will be Wednesday night at seven o'clock at home against St. Francis. So there's still a lot to look forward to with basketball, but um, it's really sad to see uh, football starting to wind down a bit. Um, this is the last show of this semester, but once we come back next semester, we'll probably start uh, towards mid-January, mid to late January. But once we come back, our focus will be shifted to basketball. So that'll be really exciting. We'll talk about men's and women's um, basketball, not only in the SEC, but um, NCAA overall. Uh, we'll look at hockey some more, and we'll be talking about the postseason with uh, the NFL. We'll be talking about the playoffs, looking forward to the Super Bowl. So a lot of exciting things to come, but um, we hope you've enjoyed this semester. It's been really exciting with college football. Uh, we're excited to see where the Vols uh, end up going for their bowl and excited to see what happens there. But um, thanks for listening this semester. We will see you in 2015.